Hello, this is Lawrence Lewis. And this is Sister Christian. Today is Friday, May 8th. This is the Producers Happy Hour, a daily podcast with two producers on opposite coasts, reaching out to our filmmaking and live event community to hear your stories about how the pandemic has affected you, your life, and your work. It's important for us to keep sharing our experiences, our ideas, our creativity. Your stories let us know that we're not alone, and we need that right now. Email us, or better yet, record a one- to two-minute voice memo and send it to producershappyhour at gmail.com. Just follow the instructions on our website, producershappyhour.com. And please share this show with your friends, your colleagues, your veterinarian, maybe your dentist too. (laughs) We want these stories to be heard. They're human stories, even though we're all in the entertainment business and sometimes they're dramatic and we have a little flair to them. (laughs) They're all still human stories and we feel everyone can relate. Yes. Uh, Christian, today we're chatting with film director and experiential designer Kyle Ruddick. I know. I'm very great, excited. <laughs> <laughs> he's a great guy. I've worked with him many times. He is so connected to story and emotion, you know, and he does a lot of experiential. So it's it's an interesting chat because those are all the things that feel lost on us right now, right? Exactly. The human experience, emotional yeah. experience, connectivity. So it's like, yeah, yeah it's a challenging time. But, I uh, know. And I, he had an idea and he's gotten creative during this. So he yeah. has a project happening yeah, right uh, now. It's going to be fantastic to hear about. So, all right. What? How are you doing, another week. Damn it! <laughs> you, you are not okay. Uh, no, I think I am okay. I'm just tired, and uh, okay. Yeah, I'm just just tired. Just kind of tired. I'm just all over okay. the place. Right? Well, we've had. I like, didn't mean to accuse you. Two months. <laughs> we've had like two months of you know just kind of like no structure. Even though the show has given us structure, it still is like yeah. as soon as this is done. But this uh, is a everyday thing, and, you know, it's been quite a yeah. hustle. So, yeah, everything can, you know, it's a little wearing for sure. Yeah. And now incorporating different forms of work into my daily life, mm-hmm. it seems like mm-hmm. is going to start happening. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm just figuring I'm it out as everyone else is. How about you? 100% with you on that. So, <sighs> you know, I'm doing good. I think I'm looking forward to the weekend. Um, It just keeps getting prettier and prettier here in New York, although I think we're supposed to have, (laughs) I think in the Adirondacks, we're supposed to have snow or something. I saw that, yeah. (laughs) Because, you know, know, we're supposed to have some cold weather, and then you guys are having like a tremendous heat wave, right? Something coming at you. Yeah. Death Valley. I don't know. So, (laughs) (laughs) words. But, no, it's going to be a great weekend, and maybe we'll venture out over here, but, you know, safely, of course. And um, I think uh, I've come to the realization that there's a fever pitch right now in our business to go back to work the right way. And it has really caused a lot of anxiety in me because, you know, I'm, I'm battling two things. Like, I think I had hunkered down to sweat this out a little longer but I also don't want to sound like I'm not excited or looking forward to it being over but those two things are kind of battling themselves right now because um I I just don't know I'm concerned about my safety yeah for sure my own personal safety and then also providing safety for those around me yeah that's important Mm -hmm. and today we wake up with the news that 20.5 million People lost their jobs in April. Yeah. Which is Mm -hmm. 14.7% the highest measure since the Great Depression. Yes. And, you know, if you saw any of the interviews this morning, the, you know, White House economist, and I can't remember that guy's name. He's like, yeah, he he foresees it, even though it's like at 20% right now, looking like it's going to go up to 25% before, you know, we start seeing going over the hump. So, yes. yeah, there's a there's at least, you know, May is going to be another hurt month. But yeah, but we'll, it will be. Yeah. For sure. But then they anticipate on the backside of that, if we are opening correctly, <laughs> yeah. then, um, you know, it'll start to tick back up. So and today we're going into phase two here in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles. I know. Very interesting to me. Yeah. Which means some retail establishments are open for curbside pickup. Mm-hmm. And some trails are open. Are you going and, to participate uh, in any retail curbside pickups? I don't think I have any need. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have no retail needs right now. <laughs> um, all my needs are met. 
<laughs> so I don't really see. You don't have a toy uh, store or a, a no, florist I don't need to get to? Okay. <laughs> no, I was thinking about getting my mom flowers right. for Mother's Day mm-hmm. and dropping them off at her house. But Aww. she often says, don't spend your money on flowers. This year, though. Um, this year. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. No, but I have a gift for her. Uh, nice. So I'm still going to probably head out there mm-hmm. on Sunday and, and I sent, do something uh, like through the front window. Nice. I sent my mom um, Junior's Cheesecake. And if you've ever been to Brooklyn, they're, uh, on flat right there on Flatbush is uh, Junior's Cheesecake. And they're an old school, like soul food, you know, diner type establishment that has very famous cheesecakes and you can ship them out all over the world. So I sent my mom and and my mother-in-law, uh, cheesecakes. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I know. Oh, for sweet. Mother's Day. So. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, you nice. know, I mean, I do I, I do agree with the flowers thing. They're fun to get. But also, too, you know, it feels like, you know, three or four day and then you're done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah, the cheesecake, so go right to your hips. It's perfect. That was a quote from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christian, there's this thing that I, I think I shared with you, SAG-AFTRA yes. and IOTSE are presenting a virtual town hall with U.S. Representative Adam Schiff. Right. It's a YouTube live-streamed event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it happens on May 12th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time. Oh, that's uh, Tuesday? Is that right? Yes, Tuesday. Okay. So uh, I'm going to put a link to this in the show note, but you can find it just by Googling or going on YouTube and searching for sag After and IOTSE present virtual town hall. It's interesting. I'm curious to see what, you know, what's going to happen. So also on Tuesday is uh, if anybody belongs to WearSpot, they're doing a 80 person Zoom. How the heck are we going to get back to work meeting as well? which is at 2 p.m. And I had sent in a request for an invite, and I got in. I'm one of the 80 out of the 9,000. So, yeah. Nice. I mean, you know, I I don't – I I probably won't know anyone there. (laughs) But I don't – it's not (laughs) like I'm going to be talking. You know what I mean? (laughs) So Right. You're just listening in. Yeah, exactly. They asked for if you had a question or whatever, and I I didn't. I just – I vented some concerns, and I'm sure that they'll touch on them because everybody's been discussing – what we're discussing at this point like it's not right, exactly it's not our job to implement and it's no. uh, <laughs> and we're very nervous about it <laughs> yeah i saw somebody else discussing on one of the boards it was a, a long story posted by i think a gaffer who got sick oh wow covid19 okay and he knew he feels like you, you know you can't know but he feels like he knows who he got it from and it was the client on set who was coughing the whole time the whole time right. and not covering their mouths of course his post was about he felt like he should have told the AD and took a firmer stance because this was leading up to this was in the final days of being able to film. Mm-hmm. Should have said, hey, this guy needs to get offset. And uh huh. But, know, he, but or, that person or, is paying for it. Right. So I know. Okay. I know. So, yeah. so it creates this thing. Mm-hmm. So the, the conversation smartly led to this is why it needs to be a third party company that is on set to monitor best practices. Right, like conflict of interest. Exactly. Like imagine, you know, your AD coming up to you and telling you you had to kick your client off set. I wonder, and you know how I'm fascinated I am about calendar and dates. I wonder what date that gaffer was on set because I was filming in L.A. on the 8th. And mm-hmm. at that point, you know, we had disinfected the bathrooms. We did a deep clean as best we could, but we didn't go too far because at that point, you know, I don't think anyone had, it, it still wasn't ramped up, even though we were all cautious about it. So there were mm-hmm. jokes going around of like when somebody coughed, they'd be like, you know, it was a, a point or something. <laughs> yeah. And I remember my client being freaked out and her, she would follow people around. And tell them to cover oh, their really? mouth and stuff. And oh, I was like, good. that's good. best case scenario to me. Totally. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, a third party monitor, like a fire safety monitor. Yeah. It's a fire safety officer, something like that. A third party who can shut something down that isn't the production company or the client or the agency. And then it's neutral. And that's just who you got to listen to. So I think that is very important. Completely agree on that because, you know, like just like we have SAG monitors, when they come mm-hmm. to set or DGA reps stop by, they're just making sure that, you know, everything is copacetic. So yeah. I fully agree with, I mean, it can't be us. Otherwise, it's yeah, just no. a big conflict of interest because not yeah. all of us have ethics. So we have a voice memo <gasps> from AJ Winslow. Oh, my goodness. Let's take a listen. 
Hey, my name is AJ Winslow. I'm based out of Bellingham, Washington, and I'm a, a producer, director, and I own, uh, along with my producing partner, Jim Pigeon, the company Rocket Soul Studios. We actually were uniquely positioned as the coronavirus uh, really started impacting communities because we had a film called Freedom's Path that we shot in Arkansas this last fall that's now in post-production. So we feel really fortunate that we still have a project that we can be working on but what the horizon looks like for distribution for that film is is relatively uncertain um, but but we're hopeful that all of these platforms and festivals are really going to need content um, so so we'll see how we navigate that and then we have some other projects that are in pre-production we were just about to really start the funding outreach for and of course those are kind of on hold but as states start to kind of loosen laws and regulations related to corona. Um, we're really looking looking to, to push forward with shooting in some of the states that have good incentives and also haven't been impacted by the virus and are still relatively safe. Any advice I would offer to anyone would just be uh, stay strong and, and keep pushing forward. And I think that there is actually, you know, a window for production opening soon in some of these other markets that haven't been impacted so um, so much by the coronavirus. So, uh, yeah, let's all hang in there and hope it ends soon. Take care. Thanks, AJ. I mean, sounds like he's keeping busy. Of course, you know, stay strong, keep hoping because, yeah, hopefully we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your contribution. And if you guys want to share your stories, you can email them to producershappyhour at gmail.com. Just record it on your smartphone. Let us know what's going on in your world. And if you have any thoughts, any ideas, send it to us. It's time to get on to our interview. Uh, but first, Christian, we have the Take Action page on our website, producershappyhour.com. And we have a lot of resources there for you to look at, a lot of information about all the federal aid that you can apply for. Mm -hmm. And some petitions and ways to volunteer and donate. Ooh, and I do have a thing. I got a call from somebody yesterday to give me a trick to try about the unemployment. So I'm going to try that trick. And if it works, I'm going to come back on Monday and talk about it on the show. Exciting. Yeah. She said everybody she's told it's worked for them to get their Ooh, New York okay. unemployment. New York unemployment. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, mm -hmm. let us know okay. uh, on Monday. And on Monday, we're going to have our second Crew Safety Roundtable. So be sure to listen in for that. But let's get on with Kyle Ruddick. Kyle is a film director and an experienced designer. He comes from a strong VFX and post-production background, most notably his work with Lucasfilms on a little series called Star Wars. Kyle is the founder of documentary film project One Day on Earth, which produced the first film made in every country of the world with the support of thousands of volunteer filmmakers dozens of nonprofits, and the United Nations. At One Day on Earth, he followed up this global effort with a PBS series on the future of the American city. Kyle works consistently as a commercial director and is represented by Hilo. He is sought for his ability to combine real people, innovative experience design, and authentic emotion. Kyle is also the creator of Magic Dance Mirror, an interactive augmented reality dance experience seen everywhere from E3 to Burning Man to Slam Dance. Let's take a listen. Hi, Kyle. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we'd love to start out by finding out how you're doing, how your family's doing. You're on the West Coast, right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing well, thank you. My family is back east in Florida. And they're also doing well. My immediate family is just my parents, and they're retired. So it's kind of a an easier situation, I think, in some ways. It's, it hasn't drastically affected them. But um, for me, other than um, just some, like, serious outlook changes, let's call them, mm -hmm. I feel pretty fortunate. Despite, if you look at social media, the news, you start to feel some weight on your shoulders and your heart. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta... <laughs> You're like, you gotta I'm just gonna check in. And then all of a sudden mm. it's like, oh, the memes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are, are you in um, Are you in LA? I am. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm up in Topanga Canyon, which is actually... Oh, a, I'm a very... Favorite. feel more lucky than ever to be up here because I am still able to sort of connect with nature and a regular yes. basis and, and walk, even just walking my street kind mm -hmm. of 
resets yeah. me. I, I do daily walks or I um, drive all the way up to uh, Ventura to go in the ocean. Nice. So one oh, or the other lovely. every day. Otherwise, uh, mm-hmm. I've noticed that I start to almost feel panicky by the end of the day and really messed up and can't sleep very well. So that's been kind of one of my routines is to just, mm-hmm. you know, I was already in that routine before this, but I think like now it's just become like those, those sort of peace of mind things have become more essential. Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone's priorities have shifted a bit. So give us a little bit of a background. I mean, we've read your bio, we know your background, but give us a little bit of what were you up to the weeks leading up to the shutdowns and, and the outbreak and everything? Right. Where was your mind and do you have projects in the works? What was going on with you at that time? Yeah, I did. I had a shoot that was canceled. I was doing a commercial project that supposedly is only postponed, but you know, we'll we'll say a little prayer for that for uh, Post-it Note, and we were going. Oh, to, yes, that's we, right. I yeah, mean, we were yeah, going yeah, to we film with this. the mayor of Stockton, California, which you know, the Bay Area was one of the first places to shut down. We were up there scouting a week before, and it was like, okay, I think this is going to work, and then like everything sort of happened that week. That was when like. It came out that Tom Hanks had it and like the World Health Organization, I think, declared it a real thing or whatever they said. And then it was sort of a game of canceled chicken, I would call it, too. Like, who's who's going to cancel who's gonna, first? Who's going to pull the plug first? Yeah. And so we were sort of like, uh, this is, you know, we're losing locations by the minute. You know, like, it's like, it's just like was like a cascading, like, <laughs> we'll just keep saying we'll shoot it. And then uh, finally the client pull the plug which you know we were sort of thankful for at that point because it was like no one at that given the news no one we were trying to film in public places too and um, Mm -hmm. it just the whole thing was like we had come up with ways to work around it but it was just it wasn't fitting the moment and it didn't make sense and you know, a week before I was like, oh, this will be fine. They're going to have to shelve it for a while, but it'll be fine, you know, <laughs> but that changed quickly. Yeah. From there, I guess I just sort of like did the thing what a lot of people did, which is like almost nothing. You know, I just, I went shopping, made a bunch of food and I sort of just tried to stay in the moment and try not to panic, absorbed way too much media and, you know, <laughs> drank heavily and ate a lot. I got really good at cooking. I'm already quite into cooking, but like, uh, okay, I'll go, I'll cook for three hours today (laughs) because why not? Wow. Something sort of happened by March 23rd. I was like, I had a list of things that I need to do something with this time, you know, this free time or whatever this is. I wrote a treatment for a TV show idea around Mm -hmm. COVID-19 and Mm-hmm. shared it with some old business partners of mine and shared it with a director friend of mine. And now we're shopping that show with CAA and a production company. And it's got some of his initial rejections, but there's still the big fish out there looking at it. So it's kind of like terribly to say anything good, but it did feel good to conceptualize an idea that could be in the moment that was relevant to the moment and could be executed in the moment and push it out into the world and then like see people react to it very quickly. And I never would have done any of that. I never had an intention right. to mm-hmm. do. Yeah. I didn't even think I'd be doing anything in TV this year. So like, you know, even to just be in those conversations, like within three weeks, well, weird. So much has changed. I think yeah. a lot of us took that first, you know, little bit to get over the shock and then, or some, some of us jumped right into doing like a project right away. And then now we're kind of in a slump. So everybody was doing it differently. So, mm-hmm. you know, it sounds like you <laughs> went through the process and then your creative juices started flowing, as they say. How did the idea come about? Like, what's the angle? I founded this project almost 10 years ago or more than 10 years ago called One Day on Earth. And so we had like 40,000 participants in that project. And so it was like, you know, people, it was a big user generated project with people all over the world telling the story of one day. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, well, look, like a user generated model that's global within this COVID-19 experience, Mm -hmm. you know, create a pretty powerful anthemic voice and narrative for what this is like globally. You could really see, I feel like um, one of my biggest concerns and fears in the moment is the polarization around the misinformation that's occurring on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And everyone feels like they need to take a strong side or stance and and become an expert and know and 
and all these other things. And, and the truth is, is that we have these emotional human experiences that are much more similar that are everyone's going through. Originally with One Day on Earth, that was sort of like the hope too. It's almost like, oh my gosh, this is really needed right now. Like, right. I feel like we're grasping at straws for like a universal narrative. Government is very convoluted. The media is sort of like doing an okay job, but like it's also, there's just a lot of it. And then social media is a nightmare. So I just think that like yeah. the platform of engaging with social media, I think is sort of like, mm -hmm. because it's based on retention algorithms and how much you're watching and every, right. reinforcing mm -hmm. ideas that are specific around your beliefs. If someone makes something outrageous and sensational and they put it out there and it's divisive, it actually gets in more relevance and attention then mm -hmm. I think it should. I think everyone actually is, is actually needing right now more of a right. chicken soup for the soul experience throughout this, mm -hmm. which is like... Abs absolutely. I agree. Yeah. It, we had a very huge sense of unity when all of this came about. You know what I mean? And it's now unraveled into almost worse than it was before when it comes to choosing sides, like you said. Yeah. And we were craving this, you know, like change in, you know, humanity. And, you know, maybe this will be the thing that brings us together as humans and already lo and behold <laughs> already i feeling yeah. like uh, well there's definitely the the cracks in that right and so i, I think there is an <laughs> element though of still putting you know if you put something on tv that did make you feel that way a lot of mm -hmm. people would tune in because they'd be like right oh yeah you know like Thank goodness it's a little Maybe grounding like, and a little bit mm -hmm. like you know we're not just picking scabs here basically as much as we love doing that <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah. And, hey. <laughs> it's like Sorry. my favorite thing. You know, like, Emotional. Yeah, that's the intention of that show. And, like, um, I feel deeply about it, not just because of, like, social media or whatever, because it, we'd be using a lot of social media to create that show and get a user-generated perspective. But I do think that there is a, um element of encouragement. I, again, I just think that narrative has never been more clear to me more in this way of like or, or lack of or problem with you know and like i guess mm -hmm. like and how important a story is to us and like oh. we're in a situation where you know as filmmakers we are lucky to have a little bit of self-awareness about how stories are created a lot of thought around audience a lot of thought about emotions and universal truths and everything else that's involved with a story I just think that right now, like, it's it's fascinating to me to sort of see the story of this pandemic unfold and, like, how people are just suffering for, like, certainty. How many people actually have this? How many people have antibodies? Mm -hmm. What is the real mortality rate? What countries are actually testing? Yeah. You know, who is actually dying from this or dying from something else? All these sorts right. of endless health questions that like, have, like, potential speculation. And it's sort of like, Either the answer is, hey, you're, we don't know right now and we're working on it and like mm -hmm. take a breath. You know, we can guess this way. We can guess that way. It's going to take a minute or, yeah, we have real information and here's what it is. And I just feel like I know myself, I'm constantly looking at those curves and I'm constantly looking at like the numbers because now I have a, a project additionally that's involved with however the narrative changes and needs to sort of be reflected in the show potentially. It's frustrating. You have thing, you know, news stories about prisons that have almost all asymptomatic prisoners. Then you're kind of like, well, was that like, I want follow. I have follow up questions for you, you know, but like no one's doing the follow up <laughs> questions. You know, what I know. I mean? or, or on the other side, you have just endless conjecture around vaccines or treatments, and right. it just becomes a rabbit hole. <laughs> I think a, a big issue for everybody was the desire of factual information yeah whether they were an artist or not or a documentary filmmaker or not or a storyteller or not i think everybody was really craving for some real yeah. and solid inf yeah solid information and still are and doing what we do i mean that's basically why we started the podcast we're just like we just need to find out what's going on who's Please. who's doing what the initial start of the podcast was like who's working who's not working how silly was that, right? Like <laughs> three days later, nobody was working. Right. So yeah, I think your instinctual need to tell the story was put into overdrive, which is really honorable because I think our second episode was called The Power of Storytelling because at that point we needed to hear what yeah. was going on because we're kind of lacking it from certain governmental well, institutions. 
I've been talking with people just preliminarily around the world because of this project too. And it's very interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of similarities in other countries. I talked with some people in Brazil, you know, they have um, a similar government to ours at this point. There's a lot of misinformation. There's like the favelas mm -hmm. specifically are kind of like an impossible place to socially distance. They're sort of on lockdown, but they're still, you know, it's, it's crazy how much similarity there is in almost like different windows of time. I realized quickly that like everyone who's in the documentary world is sort of thinking the same thing. Like, what can I shoot about this? Like, how do I archive this moment yeah. in a meaningful way that is like, you know, uses my skill set? Why don't we talk a little bit about experiential and how this may affect you as an artist? I know that there's safety concerns. I know people don't want to touch each other. Well, they want to, but they shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> And so from the experiential world, how do you see that moving forward? Or if it does, or, you know, how is it going to change? A lot of the work I do in the commercial business involves an experience and a film. I have a company called Kinetic Magic that does these interactive visual experiences with real-time animation for events and parties. And yeah. like a rental business, we have something called the magic dance mirror and the magic paint mirror and six people stand together and play with an interactive screen. Those aren't rented so quickly. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting many custom requests for visual interactive yeah. experiences. And I got one November hold and I was like, wow, wow, that's like a sprout. And you're like looking it's at like it a like in a giant field of ash, you know, mm -hmm. going, Oh my gosh, I got my oh. first hold in fall. You know, like for an experience. <laughs> I think unless you're able to integrate into live stream or some sort of media in the near term, we're kind of like in hold. I know we're opening back up right now, supposedly, but I don't think that that open is going to be like a, it's not a jack in the box. <laughs> Luckily, our mm. governor is very measured in how this is going to reverse itself. Opening back up is a is a very loose term, right? right now i mean the key to all so much of this and i and i have to say this which is that i'm sure someone else has said this on the show over and over again is just really having adequate testing data and information is sort of the key to really opening up yeah. and everyone knows it seemed obvious to me very early on before it was even like a mantra of everyone yes. it was like when you can start to understand the real realities of this disease, then you can actually create a real adequate plan on how to open back up. Until you have a fog over that, it's, it's insanity for everyone. I will say this, is that from an experiential side, when it does fully open back up, it's going to be gangbusters because everyone's going to be so sick of looking at their screen, so sick of being inside, that they're really, really, really going to yearn for some sort of social interaction, it's going to feel very special and very big. And I predict some very large parties eventually. Yeah. But yeah. because there's a cautiousness and a lack of information, it may not happen like, boom, it will probably, in my mind, happen more slowly. It will wake up and we'll be yep. like, oh, blowing up, you know? Exactly. I think there'll be a test. Somebody will go out there and do it first, right? Once we see, once we wait a couple of weeks to see if anything arises out of it, then it'll start happening. Yeah. Like, Here's a question for you, because we're kind of dancing around this topic a little bit of the realities. How do you trust? I mean, you look at a, a long lens shot of a beach and it looks like there's, you know, thousands of people on top of each other. And then you see the overhead and it looks like, oh, they're all about, you know, maybe even 10, 20 feet apart. Same thing with these protests that happened all around different cities where people protesting wanting to open the country back up. And then you read further and you find out each protest in these cities had maybe 100 people there, maybe 200 people there. Not earth shattering, not the Women's March in downtown L.A. or <laughs> all across the country. In speaking about your docu-series, how do you quantify that when there's so much misinformation and, and obviously... I would assume your intent is to find the truth and convey the truth. But how do you do that in this kind of climate? I think you have to look for the common ground things that are still interesting. If you do an episode like we had one episode, we developed quite a bit on love, for instance, love in this time. You can kind of really go into quite detail of what it's like to be sheltering at home with your partner where you're on top of each other or like you know, we had some stories we were looking at where people are doing Zoom weddings and mm -hmm. how is dating still like affected? And, you know, those are sort of like 
real things that impact us more on a day-to-day basis that are really part of our reality that are individual experiences that you can't deny as untrue. There is some universal common ground. Additionally, even like looking at some of these protesters, now they've gone on off onto those egregious, like rifle carrying racist sort of side of things, you know, backed by Trump or whatever. But then there's other people who are just like, they don't have a lot of good information and they don't see know anyone who's sick around them and they don't have any money coming in. Yeah. Ultimately, like yeah. they're like, what the hell? As far as I can tell, the hospital is not full and I need to get back to work. And, and the government's telling us we have to stay inside. And they've not received any of their benefits yet. Not received yet. anything. I mean, there's just yeah. some, right. There's no right. incentive to stay home if you're not being... Yeah, so without of. getting into those finger pointing moments a little too much, there is an element of like, my gosh, two more weeks and I'm just going to have to sell this thing. And I think that that's also kind of common ground. You know, I think that like we're mm-hmm. all kind of suffering in those ways. The stories that we're creating on our own are the ones that kind of get more polarized and like we're kind of like pointing to this and that. But the universal experiences are actually similar and do carry a bit of truth to them it would be important to not completely shy away, but I do feel that like I would want to be very careful and guarded about becoming like the core information source around specific medicine or specific Mm. policy within that show. Because I think right now it's just, it's just moving too quickly and my skepticism there. And I'll add this about skepticism. I think it's more valuable than ever to be open as storytellers, especially to all sides of things. It's also really important to acknowledge when something isn't probably true. And so it's kind of like this instinctual slash research slash concrete thing that you're trying to put together. But for me, skepticism is free because it allows me to be open to my identity not being challenged by being wrong. A lot of people feel like they picked a side and now they're on that side. And now if they're wrong, somehow that's a challenge to who they are, their belief, identity, exactly. and tribe, and, and place in the world and right. everything else. It's actually sort of disturbing and problematic. It's understandable. It's human nature. But on the other side of it, it's sort of like, hey, look, if we all wake up one day and it's just like, yep, this wasn't even as bad as the flu, all that bullshit that I don't actually believe, by the way. But if that mm-hmm. came true, I'm not going to go oh my God, but I'm going to be like, great. <laughs> you know, yeah, thank you know like, I am so happy I was wrong. <laughs> I am so relieved that like I had any concern, right. you know, boy, let's have a drink and laugh that off. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I'm not going to be like, no, <laughs> you're lying. And hold on. Damn, like, like, hold damn on. government. Like, that's me, you know? like I'm not going to be, um, yeah, the worst case scenario is I get to go high five all those people and say, hey, thanks for being right. I know. It's like being a Mets fan or a Jets fan. You bought all the gear. You can't go back now, guys. <laughs> there is so much about how we relate to sports that is unfortunately like integrated into the rest of society now on like the rest of society. I mean, it goes it goes into reality shows. It, it's permeated uh-huh. our culture, the us versus them. Mm-hmm. It's pretty wild. Mm-hmm. A lot of the thinking right now, Kyle, is everything's different for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. And so we get to rewrite the rule book. And we, especially you as as a storyteller, as a director, Mm -hmm. you have some leadership in this, right? How do we tell these stories? What's what's the way we're going to go forward and tell these stories? If we get to rewrite the rules, you know, what what would you like to see come out of that? Uh, Well, a few things, I guess, specifically in the commercial documentary side, there's always been this weird thing. I come from a side where it was independent film, so I kind of know what it's like to be scrappy and like yeah, nimble yeah. and just DIY everything. But then like having a lot of commercial experience now, I know what that side's like. And I think that going back to that is just like, one is like, it's always been about a day rate. I right. feel like moving to more for directors, especially moving to a percentage basis. And like, I've always been pushing for more shoot days. I've been like trying to steal shoot days since one shoot day is already a month of my life anyways. Like, why would I want to like hamstring and shackle myself to one day? You know, when like in reality, I got to work for it on a month anyhow. There's a reconciliation around that. And as a director, I'd like to move Mm -hmm. to more percentage of budgets model. 
more shoot days, but less overhead on them is fine with me. Trying to cram everything into like that one day because that day has so much overhead. Obviously, there needs to be some oversight for the clients and everything else, but I do think we have an opportunity in this to be a little bit like you're going to have to trust us a little bit more to execute on these things. And obviously, there's ways that people could live stream in and everything else, but I think that my hope would just be you know, longer time frames to tell the story. Like, I mean, I, I do projects. Yes, I'm making money. Yes, there's business behind it. But like mm-hmm. anything I commit to, I'm like 100% into how good it turns out. Like, I think yeah. that most people in this business that's, that mm-hmm. thrive and survive are the same way. You know, they don't go in and go, oh, no, I'm going to half-ass this because it's one shoot day. Well, I may have been on one of those drives. <laughs> <well. laughs> uh, oh, shall remain nameless. <laughs> On a personal level, all of us are used to a very topsy-turvy business anyhow. We are constantly reinventing ourselves creatively. And our job is to sit around and invent and create. Right now, we're just faced with like a new challenge. And like we sit around all day and we sort of try to invent. I do think that, you know, the mother of invention is necessity. And I know that the long-range economic outlook is not great. But I do think that the more that you can allow that to become part of your identity and story, and I'm trying to do that myself, (laughs) the better you're going to feel, the better you can say, you know what, I'm a creative. That's what I do for a living. I better start creating around what my um, constraints are right now. And I love constraints. I personally have been trying to embrace the moment as new constraints and how do I you know, compassionately work in them. So that's what I was going to ask you because, you know, so much of your work is so rooted, I mean, obviously rooted in story, but rooted in human connectivity and emotions and interaction. Do you have any advice for, you know, the film crew that you work with or the other creatives out there? Is now the time to pivot and find new ways of telling these stories? Or is it sitting back, waiting, seeing what happens until you go back out into exploring these kind of connections between humans? I think um, ooh, making sure that you're in the present at some point every day and kind of look at yourself in some way, the ground, all these things in the future that may or may not happen are just possibilities. I mean, I'm not saying don't make appropriate choices and changes. I'm just sort of saying that, like, don't let it ground you into a sense of hopelessness. There is still incredible opportunities to be creative and just go do something that you love and care about right now. That's going to keep you alive. And it might even turn in, it might even offer new growth. Because I know that for me, I immediately started doing things that I never thought I would do because of the moment. And it did offer like a little bit of encouragement. Now, whether this show goes or not, I still feel like it was the right thing to do to go through the process. It feels amazing to like put together a sizzle and a treatment and chop it around and start to prepare for it and kind of go, oh, I'm doing something. I'm doing something I care Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. and it feels good. If you're sitting on your couch right now as a, a sound guy, kind of just waiting for the phone to ring, there's probably some music you could write and there's maybe a podcast you could make maybe a film even mean to shoot i mean we just have to do it you know what i mean like i think yeah like you've got your pandemic vacation right now i get that there's pressure on you to make money and you should don't wait by the door get out there and start making stuff and i've seen a lot of friends making cool amazing stuff that i never knew that they had the capability or perspective inside yeah. themselves. And I'm just like, God, that's beautiful. It's blowing me away, to be honest. Like the expression of creativity from some of my friends in the business that is like just mm. happening organically. And I think that things, this too shall pass. Taking that opportunity to, to, to move forward with something is going to feel good. You know, and like try things. If it doesn't feel right, try something else. I did that myself even. Like one day I like talked to my cat on video about like this whole thing. because I, I... Like, And it was funny, you know, it's like I videoed it and I put it up online and people are like, holy shit, this is funny. And it's like, it's like. Kyle, I was really hoping you were going to turn that into a, a series. 
because I want to see more of those. Can you please continue doing it? Okay, it's well, great. that was my plan, it. but then I was sort of like, I'm not sure if this is good enough, and I have other things. It was hilarious. I loved it. We'll put a link in the show notes because I thought it was great, and I, I was hoping it was going to be a daily chat with your cat. I'm uh, it was great. It. I, I needed that encouragement back. Because we can yeah, least. It's this. It's like you get filled up with all this anxiety. Really, what it comes from is I would like come to my girlfriend and, you know, your partner. It's like you kind of start dumping on your partner all of the things that are going on. Like, yeah. It's good that oh, you can listen yeah. and talk about it. But like at some point, it's like yeah. telling her about some news story that disturbed me it starts to become bad. And so like the best thing I could do, like I was just like, mm-hmm. OK, I'm going to talk to the cat. <laughs> and talk to the cat exactly but it's funny because i did it intentionally just to bring myself back into the moment it wasn't even like i had this big idea for a performance i just started doing it out of necessity to kind of remember that like this creature oh, we need more. is like wise in this funny way which is like yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah cool you read that <laughs> yeah I mean, no matter what the cat is unshaken it doesn't totally you know, and yeah. we gotta learn a little bit about those things. Like we gotta, like, in fact, better. a little annoyed. And uh, so that's like therapy. Like even if you need to um, film yourself talking to your pet every day. I think I even bought talktoyourcat.com. I literally like was like, oh, I'm gonna do this, and then like. Okay. Nineteen ninety nine a year. Why not? What do we What do we need to do to make this happen? Because I want to see more. I want to see more of those. We'll produce it. We'll put it on our website. So, Kyle, thank you so much for chatting with us today. This has been an absolute pleasure and a bright part because, you know, we never know how these interviews are going to go. And this one's been really, (laughs) really fun. So thank you so much. Before we let you go, what do you miss most or what are you looking forward to most? I know we're kind of in a limbo right now of can and can'ts. Hmm. And I I know. I mean, I miss touching strangers and going to dive bar bathrooms. That's just me. I don't miss the dive bar bathroom, but um, oh, I think mm, so. a good dive bar bathroom, man. Bad. You're just like, I don't, I'm getting scurvy There's right now. There's usually some good literature in there, but I just don't want to hang out long enough to get oh, it all. Mm. Man, it's such a big topic. Um, but I, I, I think I miss going out to live music and being able to like, experience yeah. live music with people together and dance and feel like yeah. that freedom of the mm-hmm. moment where you're like, you're collectively putting your phone down and disconnecting from right. all of the voices on your screen and just kind of listening mm-hmm. and being in the present with people and feeling like, I don't know, there's something really special about that that's affected my life for many years. And yeah. like mm-hmm. right now, I think we're kind of a, a long way from having some great concerts, unfortunately. So I, maybe miss it the most because I think it's probably going to take a while for it to come back. You know, I've had many film treatments and ideas come from going to shows and then the middle of the show be like, including one day on the earth, by the way, I was, I had the entire inspiration for one day on earth while listening to live music being played by people from all over the world that had never played together before. And so it was so beautiful and immediate and in a moment and touching that I had this like epiphany of like, oh my God, what if we could do something like that with film? What if we can all co-create at the same time? And that's where One Day on Earth mm-hmm. started. I couldn't get that idea out of my head. I owe that to going to live music. I also think that like many other people see many other benefits from it. So I hope that comes back in a huge way and I'm certain it will, but um, I miss it. Wow. Yeah. Take care, and hopefully I'll see you in person soon. Yeah, likewise. Thank- oh, my God. Oh, Lawrence, like, I could have spoken to him all I know. day. I knew he was oh. he's your tribe for sure. I mean, he's my tribe, too, but yeah. he's, he's a great guy. I've worked with him a lot, as I said, and he no, is great. so connected to story and human story, and he fights for mm-hmm. story so much, and the stories he tells have to do with connectivity and human emotion. And oh, yeah. It's just an interesting time right now to be that kind of artist, that kind of storyteller, when we have to be so disconnected and separated, right? Yeah. So you can tell he feels all the feels. Absolutely, hundred percent. From you know creating the process, or when you when you speak to him, he's just emotionally invested in everything he does. It's yes. amazing. Comes right it through. Does. And I like what he said. Mm-hmm. Skepticism is more valuable than ever right now, which is, uh, as we're learning, very very true. Yeah. Skepticism is free. It is free. 
It's free. <laughs> that was a genius. <laughs> so, well, Lawrence, this show was edited and co-produced by Rob Bloomkey. Artwork and logo design by Christopher Daniels. And our music was composed by Kyle Puccia. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, we're off for the weekend, so we will see you on Monday. Lawrence, wash your hands. <laughs> don't. I mean, I've been touching my face lately, and I get it. I know, but I just think that still not, I don't I go think, outside, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I think I've completely changed some habits. One, I, I don't touch yeah. my face anymore without a tissue or something. I know it's great. Yeah. I try, but in the end, uh, I have hair and stuff, so... Yeah. So wash your hands, don't touch your face, clean that dirty ass phone of yours, and please, <laughs> if you're going to go outside, wear a mask. Stay safe, stay connected, and stay active, and everybody, please do it all while still staying home. And be sure to send us your voice recordings or your emails to producershappyhour at gmail.com. Lawrence, how do people reach you if they want you? They can get me for voiceover work at voiceoflawrence.com or for producing lawrencetlewis.com. How about for you, Christian? How's that new website coming? SisterChristianProduces.com. And I'm not going to, I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> I keep needling you about it. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, please needle on and maybe it'll do it. <laughs> All right, guys. Bye. See you Monday.